final stage, first and foremost, the man Alex Morton, my second speaker, the most important guy in my debate career. Um, one of the best friends outside of debate, and that's one of the best things that I like, like about this day. So now we don't just like end our friendship right as an debate center, and he truly makes this an enjoyable experience. Um, second, never were our breakfast that have enabled us to get to this place because we wouldn't have been able to do with them. Saratoga, Family International, Brett, and GT, David Daniel, and every other person that helped us in that. Um, John Nathan, our private coach, we would literally be nothing without him in terms of the debate. We didn't know we were doing software here. He coached us and made us who we are today. Um, and Mr. Lincoln, the guy that's standing right back there, great guy, taught us how to kind of have a play and taught us a lot more stuff on how to be good people. Um, in my opinion, they're, they're okay. <laughs>
Gen 6, 18 further, that should the EU join the BRI framework dictates that, it, that there would be a creation of intercontinental economic corridors all across Eurasia. Road 18 analyzes that better direct transport links between China and Europe would lead to a spillover effect of factories and urbanization. On 17 further, that even small increase in the BRI between China and Europe would connect Central Asia to currently untapped global supply chains, allowing for diversification and mass growth. Don't let millions sit in poverty in the
Essentially, they need to switch to green energy that's currently happening. Closing for this, the DC current Chinese mines for coal fired power plants release nearly 600 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. Overall, climate change news in 2019 finds that China's BRI could lead to an increase in global temperatures of 2.7 degrees Celsius. More emissions hurt, but emissions rise, life becomes unsustainable on Earth. The National Research Council quantifies this for a 1 degree Celsius increase to reduce profitable by 15%, contributing lives to 2.5 billion people worldwide that are entering agriculture. For the National Geographic in 2018 concludes that just a 45 degree Celsius of rising temperatures will cost 133 million dollars. Let's really
for Mr. Lampert, Ian Gabriel Lampert over there, he really took two inarticulate kids our freshman year. Like, English is my second language. Jackson was kind of like nervous at public speaking. And he kind of made us comfortable entering speech and debate. And also, John Knox. Jackson and I never went to debate. We didn't have the luxury of spending $4,000 to spend six weeks in Boston or Iowa or whatever. And instead, we found one coach who was pretty cheap. We worked with him and spent a lot of time working, and we're just being incredibly thankful for him. We hope if there's a recording, he sees this. And well, this is for you, John. It's going to start off at the top of their first concession. Jackson, ready? Yes. Tony's ready. And most importantly, Judge. Let's start off at the top of their first contention about fractioning the alliance of the United States. Off the top, this argument is a historic and comparable to that of a child's play. And if R-19 finds that the only reason the United States has ever responded to the Belt and Road Initiative has been to attempt to win U.S. allies back. That is why when the beer riot expanded throughout the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia, we did not respond harshly to any of these countries. We increased OPEC and USA developmental aid to the developing country. This has two implications. First, it means Trump would never tear because he knows that that would mean a complete fracture of the EU alliance. But second, USA finds that a single one of these aid projects inherently lifted 23 million people out of poverty. Meaning at the end of the day, of every argument is very unclear. This is the clearest play to pull trigger. Go to their first impact about tariffs. Off the top, you immediately discontinue this argument. McGrath finds literally 10 days ago that Germany is already in a recession. And the European Central Bank concluded last week that the entirety of Europe is already on the brink of collapse. That is more recent than literally any piece of evidence they read in their entire case. But here's what's key. Elmer concludes that if the European Union joined the Belt and Road Initiative, the increase in investment would be enough to completely avoid that upcoming recession altogether, meaning if we're talking about recession, we're talking about the farming, and we've already won here. But then they talk about tariffs. There are two, three reasons Trump would never tear up the European Union. First, he knows that if he did this, he would shatter relations with multiple geopolitical hegemons who have veto seats on the United Nations Security Council. He knows he would never do this. Second, he has no political capital to tear up the European Union, considering he has the election and the impeachment inquiry. He is there going to come up here and say that he would actually care because it helps him in the election. If it would help him in the election, he would do it either world, and there's no reason you have to affirm it. Third and most importantly, in order to tear up a country, he has to go through Congress. If he is going to obey Congress, he would have to declare a national security emergency. Considering the EU, like, I don't know, building some buildings with China isn't a national security emergency, that would shatter his credibility. But also, they don't tell you why this would cause a recession. We would say that we have a larger trade war with China, and it's not causing a recession, because countries can diversify their markets. Also, we argue if we read a single one of our links about diversifying Europe, it's terminal defense on this argument. Go to the second impact about trade relations. The first piece of evidence is literally talking about 2018. It's been nearly two years of these negotiations going on and trade deals have not been passed. Past. If anything, you turn the argument against them. Because if the Trump has an incentive to win Europe back, that increases the speed of negotiations, that increases the likelihood of development. Go to their second contention. Off the top, their two links really don't make sense. Now, the first one, they talk about this jungle plan and EU financing. But one, they say co-financing is already talked about right now, meaning you don't need the Belt Road Initiative. Second, we don't think the Belt Road Initiative is better than the jungle plan, because the jungle plan is isolated to Europe, but the Belt Road Initiative connects Europe to Central Asia and a multitude of other economies, which A, allows for diversification, and B, allows for growth in all of those economies as well. That's the Peter's evidence in case, which means you literally vote after Europe. Then on their second link, one, we argue this literally concedes the idea that the EU would not let China invest in things like high debt or let China invest in fossil fuels, considering Fidel finds that the EU is literally opposed to fossil fuel investment. But second, this concedes our argument about investment. Go to their first impact. Their supplement A talking about debt. There are two problems. First, South finds that in almost all cases, China has actually forgiven debt. The reason is simple. If China ties themselves economically to a country, they wouldn't want that country to collapse. But second and most importantly, they tell you that this debt already exists right now. Even if the BRI funds out of money, those countries still owe China debt, meaning collapsing the BRI doesn't save them from the debt problem. Go to their supplement B talking about coal. Off the top, they do not tell you why China actually continues coal. What John finds literally more recent than any other evidence is that China is switching towards green technology. And then by 30, a couple of weeks ago, the China is already building Latin America's largest solar panel project. But finally, they tell you that climate change goes up. Page and Harris both find that climate change is already inevitable. There's so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that even if we stop all emissions right now, the impacts are inevitable. That means voting for them is definitionally complacency and we urge an affirmative path.
organization is just happening in general, and that's not something you get to solve for. But we would say it's our DE organization is happening because if there's not enough demand for jobs in the EU, so of course we're moving to rural areas. But number two, their impact as evidence is about developing nations, but not about developed nations. But we argue that the EU is already uh, organized, has really no impact they can get off of it. Then there's something to read about like networking. First on trade, the UN finds that fewer countries have worse customs systems, which is why they see 50 days longer trade delays, not shorter. But second, well, what rights is that because infrastructure doesn't integrate themselves into local areas, as a result, what those includes that the benefits only go to China, not to those countries. But third, we rights that these products that are chosen are geopolitical reasons and not really what their current financial reasons, which is why after looking at 240 products in the Indian Ocean, all of them have zero financial feasibility, we're outlining on historical precedent here. Then on the subject of about investment, Made recent investments increasing right now is because of regulations being put in response to China being abusive. They don't put those regulations go away. FDI will not go up. But I would argue in war, in a world where we draw on BRI, political uncertainty would increase, it would cause FDI to drop even further, like it's dropping in the way of, of, of Britain right now. But then, okay, so let's go back to the supplement about employment. What Gable Brooks finds is that BRI investment is actually not productive because it only benefits the rich and not the poor, which is why Gable concludes that in countries that see BRI investment, income inequality actually increased threefold. That is going to outweigh their case because if we heard the force before, that's the standard for which we win, we, we should be winning around on who benefits the poor. We would say, number one, the people in Europe who are the poorest are going to be hurt, but also in developing countries who are the poorer than just developed countries are also going to be hurt by BRI. Let's vote on what's happened in the past, and what's passed is that the BRI has not benefited in those countries. It's only causing them to take on more debt, the products do not work, and the force of the poor are going to be hurt when you vote to join the BRI. One thing is this question
900 million people are going to fall into poverty worldwide. Those are people in developing nations who are going to be falling into poverty that we can defend through an increase in FDI. Well, let's go down to the individual arguments. So our increase in employment board, they say it's going to cause an increase in dumping. What I say is the EU has very explicit anti-dumping legislation by tariffing potential goods that they could dump into the EU's economy. With that, let's go on onto their turn in which they talk about how this um, VRI projects increase income inequality because they only invest into urbanized areas. There's two responses. First, they never explain why income inequality is bad in case. They couldn't do that because wars are incredibly important for today. But second, we give you an accurate as to why Sri Lanka, the VRI investing into a very rural area, actually helps income inequality and didn't perpetuate in the long term, probability is definitely flowing on our side. With that, going to our second board on modernizing the EU, clean the extending argument that once the EU joins the VRI, the joint will lead to an increase in infrastructure, specifically between the EU and Central Asia. That means all the area in between is going to be built and is going to be developed. We reduce poverty in those regions by 50%. You're clearly extending this, they never contest that link. But third, the most important thing you're going to be voting for us to develop on our case, is on our third point on networking nations, our sub point beyond increasing investment. We tell you that because it increases the investor confidence of EU con um, companies and Chinese companies, it increases FDI by 46% between these two countries. They give you a few responses first. They say regulations are what's preventing FDI from going to the EU right now. W what Perry 19 explains is that the regulations have no actual impact on the amount of FDI the EU is getting. Instead, it's just screening the FDI to see if it's potentially problematic and then allowing it to come through. This gives us clear access to the Elmer 19 evidence which explains that if we increase FDI or investment through the ERI, we can prevent the recession and stop 900 million people from falling into policy. He also says political uncertainty is going to decrease the amount of FDI going into the EU. He, they can see that it's, like, it's not about the countries, both EU or China, it's about the specific companies. They don't get affected by political uncertainty also. The biggest thing you need to extend is Peter, who explains that once the EU joins the VR, it's going to standardize regulations and it's going to allow us to um, solve for things like income inequality and debt traps. Let's go on to their case. First, concede that build act doesn't happen, they only invest in developing economies. Then, um, you're going to be um, extending on their second war that there's an increased incentive to work with the EU from the Trump because he wants to increase their relations and pull them back into their economy. Then, on their contingent to on advantage, uh, like for helping the developing world, they never actually explain to you why the EU and Junk or why the Junk and the VRI are actually applicable with each other. I would say the EU wants to make um, profit from the and, like, interest rates that they have from the Junk plan, they're not going to want to give those profits to China. Also, um, you, on their a uh, sub-point about debt. Extend that China always wants to make sure their trading uh, partners' economies are very stable, therefore they're going to uh, cons like forgive debt when they need to. Even if it's just 2%, it takes specific times in which, it, like, when they actually need to extend uh, relief of debt, that's when they actually do it. Um, and extend the term that um, we increase climate change or we stop climate change by spreading green technology. <laughs>
recession. But in terms of magnitude, a recession has caused directly in the developing world because of a debt crisis. It's always had a much more significant impact in the developing world than a spillover one. And here's the reason as to why. Because even if the EU recession, even if the EU goes into a recession, it's always going to be less severe than a direct debt crisis, which directly puts their financial systems under distress and directly puts millions of people in poverty because they cut social welfare. So even if you grab 100% of their offense, the offense, being on magnitude are linked to helping the, or harming the developing world, and, or the developing world in general, the a lot bigger than this. Then, let's go to their, let's go to their case. The first thing I don't respond to is Q, who says that 50% of the time, your FIs actually destroy economic value, economic value on net. And the reason you ask why is because BRI did not actually use local, or local workers, it uses Chinese workers, so they don't actually know how to function, use, how to use the infrastructure in the first place. This takes out their Central Asia argument, because if their Central Asia argument is contingent on the fact that trade flows through the region, if the infrastructure doesn't work in the first place, there's going to be no trade flowing through, there's no net economic benefit. Don't get away from just extending this impact without actually responding to the fact that the infrastructure doesn't work. But then they also go response to Greer who says that these prices are used for geopolitical purposes. And 270 of them, when they analyze the Indian Ocean, have zero profitability. There's no profitability. There's probably not much trade, and that's been happening. Central Asia isn't that benefited. But then on the FDI argument, they say that FDI increases because, uh, because, uh, oh yeah, they say FDI increases because investor confidence increases. The problem is, is that the reason why it's been decreasing, and the reason why it decreased from 2015 to now, is because of regulations. In fact, Greer's finance is going to drop by 40% going into 2018. It's going to drop even further because of more regulations. And think about it logically. Even if I think a market is more developed, if I have regulations and screen policies in terms of where I want to invest, I'm just going to go to another market that's unregulated. There's no invest, there's no incentive for these Chinese investors just because they signed for beer, and no investment plan to actually invest just because of the beer right. Now let's go back to our case on the second contention in the developing world. What we tell you for personally is that the EU signs on to the BRI, they can land a new plan with the BRI and give $315 billion of investment. They say it's not, not applicable, there's no reason as to why the, the, the new plan actually goes towards the BRI, but the past reading evidence says it's very specific. They're talking about aligning the plan in the first place, and the only way you can actually functionally align the plan is if you sign on as a block because the, the money is coming from the EU central banks, and the only way the only way, the only way you can get the money in the first place is to sign on as a block. And, uh, sign as a block. But the second thing is they also don't drop the spot of the fact that the EU just gives China access to more markets in the first place so that deeper and historic quarter cities of the areas. Now let's go back to that point of debt. Well, we tell you that when we get those evidence that the, that the infrastructure going through the developing world doesn't actually make a benefit them. So it's only, it's only transporting trade from rich regions to other rich regions. Those developing countries are just stopping points in trade. They're not getting any, any economic benefit. They say there's more debt refinancing, but the RH, they sent the RHG part line where we tell you they only refinance a little bit, a little bit of the debt for political purposes, but then afterwards they A, increase the debt in the long term, but B, the majority of debt is still there. So that's from that evidence that counter everything they're talking about, a huge subject that the huge subject of the developing world is still going into a debt crisis is because of the BRI. At the end of the day, what we tell you from the JDC evidence is that these, if these countries go into developing world debt crisis, the allows them to put 200 million people into poverty. Again, even if you have 100% other offense, at the end of the day, we're still having a bigger magnitude in terms of severity of the developing world. On the other degree, they get a uh, turn, they're going to get extended impact, which is a blip argument. No, no, no. So you mind if I take the first question in the round? Oh, uh, yeah. What scale of impact do you get off of these debt arguments? That's not responding to my question. I mean, okay, sir. So, you guys agree, because we agree not across, that there is an existing debt crisis right now. So, How okay, much so does it get worse? So, because I don't want to have to weigh against the sure. impact that I know so, you guys don't need. So, so, research it, 1% increase in debt, you can just probably have to do stuff. If you want something, if you want something to scale it up, because you didn't make the scale it up, you're just making it a grand cost part. I mean, if you made it, if you made it, here's the thing. Sharma is pretty good in saying that some BRI countries are now going to a debt crisis. Our argument is that if the BRI expands and there are more guns going to develop nations, then that debt crisis that is happening in that subset of countries is only going to expand a poorer subset of So we can agree that in either world, China is dependent on the EU, right? For what? Well, in your words, financing, right? Well, we have to yeah. give two reasons, which one of you, one of them you drop. First of all, we say it's relying on financing, but second, our second reason to why debt increases is because now China has more access to more markets than the EU is more It's also, yeah, that it's it's also, it's also not that they, wait, yeah. we're, we're going to FDI, it's not that for the EU. Our argument is yeah, like, yeah. also, also, it's not that they're relying on funding, it's that they could get more funding. So we don't have to win that funding increases to win our argument because it's regional market stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so, okay, so we talked about a recession, like, hurting the developing world, right? Yeah. So, where do you prove that the recession right now is going to spill over? Because there's a difference between a recession in the EU and a global yeah. recession. So, we yeah. have said that you do not attack the 900 million now. Okay, no, that's, that, that's not good evidence, right? because that's talking about okay, the development for, is, I mean, okay, so, so your link to this is that FBI is going to stop this. 900 million people around the world are going to be falling. Yeah. That includes developing countries. 
No, okay. First of all, that evidence is from 2000. It talks about the speech. No, it's actually okay, talking, it's actually so, from 2013, and it says another economic shock would push 900. That's basically all the 2008 financial crisis. But yeah, also, so also, it yeah, didn't answer my original question. Sure. Why does there and this is a way out of view, right? Is that why does the recession from the EU necessarily have to spill over to the degree that you're talking about? Because they're interconnected with a lot of different economies. They're so, pretty okay. trading partners. Okay, so why does slower growth in the EU mean that the developing world loses more investment and they necessarily have to go into a real debt? Oh, no, no, no. They, so they don't necessarily need to crash. There's decreases, there's increases in poverty there, right? If Europe crashes, so investors have less money, there's decreased overall growth. That's why in the 08 recession, Africa's GDP dropped 20%. Okay, again, you cannot use 2008 as an example for every single recession. Why that was like one of the worst recessions, like probably the second worst. Yeah, we like said this one's going to be pretty bad as well, like the entire Eurozone is being rich. But either way, I love the analysis. I'm not going to collapse. I love to be rich in a speech, but I'm going to do a question. So let's go over to your argument, right? You talk about mass increases in debt. So how explicitly should I weigh my analysis again? How should I weigh against it? Are you going for a social spending argument on scale or impact? Are you going to come up here and follow focus and repeat this 200 million statistic over Look, look. You're misunderstanding the argument again and again, okay? Our trauma evidence is pretty good saying that some bureau countries are taking loans and have gotten to a point where they're reaching a debt crisis. We say as bureaucrats trying to get some more access to the market, they're going to do the same with these other developing countries which are going to push into a debt crisis. So you drop the analysis that I said in summary that because they're a trading partner, China doesn't want us to do a trading partner. No, that, that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. China can't do it if they don't have money to that's, that's like refinance it. If what you're saying is true, then they would only re order refinance it. Maybe when you're first thing, China doesn't have money to get it. All right. All right. All right. <laughs>
Just like the rhetoric, the view right looks really good, but in reality, it's a giant scam. <laughs> <laughs>